Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about electronic portfolios or e-portfolios. And again, this is specifically writing portfolios. But when we do electronic portfolios, we have to take a slightly different approach than when we uh, when we're constructing or having students construct traditional paper portfolios. Um, so as always, I'm drawing from Nadra Reynolds and Rich Rice's book, Portfolio Teaching, as well as my own experience. Uh, I've had students do traditional portfolios and e-portfolios. And the first thing to really be aware of is that these are decidedly not the same thing some of the stuff will be the same. Like if, if students are incorporating essays that they've written, that essay may look the same, whether it's a Word document or a PDF or a printed page, and that's totally fine. But an e-portfolio gives you a number of other potential resources, as well as potential risks that you don't get with a traditional paper portfolio. So some of the things that Reynolds and Rich point out as pros of uh, the electronic portfolio, electronic tools, for instance, may resolve many problems inherent in paper portfolios, such as accessibility, scalability, and flexibility. Many students prefer e-portfolios to print portfolios because they already have a homepage or they enjoy the creativity that computer applications can offer. So what they mean here, accessibility, obviously this is, it's a lot easier to read something online than it is to read a hard copy of something. Not in the sense necessarily that it's easier to, to read as an individual reader. I and, I and many other people actually find it much easier to read something in hard copy than to read a digital version, but if this is the only version of a portfolio, imagine this is a portfolio. If this is the only version of that portfolio that exists, I'm the only one who can read it because I have the physical copy. The same thing is true for students. Um, if they produce a physical portfolio and turn that into an instructor, that's the only copy of that portfolio that exists. Generally, they could make multiple copies, but typically you wouldn't expect them to do that. So that's the accessibility element. Whereas if I put a portfolio online, like I've had students do research blogs, I've had students do um, blog-based uh, portfolios and things like this, as well as through course management systems like Canvas or Blackboard or eCampus, things like this. Because that information is online, it can be made accessible to multiple people. So that's more it, the availability of those documents increases. Scalability, what they mean here is basically you can put a lot more stuff into a digital portfolio than a physical portfolio. Like my teaching portfolio, for instance, that I tend to send out with job applications that ask for it is about 45 pages. That's a lengthy portfolio if I had to print that out. But because it's electronic, I can send it and it's really not as much of a problem. Now, who knows if people read all of it in detail, but because they're, because digital space is less physically imposing than physical space, I can put a lot more into that portfolio than I necessarily would want to if I was giving someone a physical copy of it. So scalability refers to the amount of information that can be put into the portfolio. And if we remember some of the key elements uh, from the, the opening video of this series about what a portfolio is, choices and variety. If you have more, more objects, more artifacts that you can put into the portfolio, you can make more choices and you can incorporate more variety. So those are great benefits of an e-portfolio. Flexibility. This is kind of connected to what can and can't be included. You can't include a video in a, a hard copy portfolio. You can't include an audio file like a podcast or something like that. Whereas with an e-portfolio, you can. 
So you have more options about what kinds of things can be incorporated. However, there are some potential drawbacks to the ePortfolio and the ones that Reynolds and uh, Rice, yeah, right. I can never remember. I suppose it's, it would be somewhat odd to have Rice as the first name, but for some reason I keep wanting to say Rich, even though that's his first name. For Reynolds and Rice, these drawbacks are, um, of course, going electronic can cause problems such as files stored in the wrong directories, broken links, corrupted disks, font differences between machines and system crashes. These are all technical problems. And generally speaking, most of them can be fixed depending on how tech savvy you are or your students are. Um, generally, none of these problems are insurmountable, but they are issues that you want to be aware of. So this is, this is something, there are ways to mitigate this if you're teaching uh, if you're teaching an ePortfolio project, one of the things that I would typically try and do is to have students create that portfolio in a relatively simple, intuitive, pre-built system. So if you can find a service that makes it very, very easy for students to upload, to link their materials, whatever it is, and that, that, and that will help organize it for them, that's going to be much, much easier than if they have to sort of start from the ground up and build from scratch. So the more infrastructure you can create for your students, the better that's going to be. And from a student perspective, what you want to do if you can, if your instructor just says, make an e-portfolio and give it to me, you want to try and find some sort of service or some sort of option where you will get that infrastructure. You will get that stuff pre-built so that you can use a service um, or, a, or a context that you know should be reliable. Now, the other really important thing um, The other really important thing is that when we require an e-portfolio, we need to teach students to write for digital spaces. Now I've done a, a video on writing for digital spaces in a different context. A lot of the same information applies here, but um, what Reynolds and Rice say about this is this. Although the basic principles, choice, variety, and selection remain the same across formats, hyperlinks enable readers to move around electronic portfolios differently. Readers can click on some links and ignore others, and each set of options gives readers a different experience. So again, this is a very important element of composing for digital spaces. You have to, to write with nonlinear reading in mind. You have to write with an awareness that readers may not read all of the content. They may skim some things, they may skip some things, they may click some links and ignore others. They may or may not watch videos, etc., etc. So you want to try and create a flexible structure that will allow readers to get as much of your portfolio experience, including that reflective component, um, while also ha ha while also acknowledging and accepting the somewhat arbitrary and flexible ways in which digital readers encounter materials online. So you want to be thinking about those things. How do I make this navigable for digital readers? What tools can I use to link to more information, to organize these materials, to create connections between related things, etc., etc. And you want all of those techniques of digital composition to guide the way that you build your e-portfolio.